episode of Jalen's Garage, the car featuring today, a very unusual car, at least here in America, 1967 Panard uh, BT24. This is truly a rare car. I don't think it's probably more than a dozen of these in the States. I don't know many how, how many of them are actually running around. I've had this for a while. This is similar to the Panard Dyna we did Oh, a while ago. It is two cylinders, 850 cc's, top speed a little over 90 miles an hour, maybe 94 miles an hour. Fascinating car. Gets 40 miles to the gallon, extremely smooth. You know, all French cars are comfortable to drive and, 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 and give just the most amazing rides. They really do the softest suspension. It's really about being comfortable. A lot of unusual features. See the brake drums here, see how prominent they are. The wheel bolts around there, the brake drum is in here. The drum brakes, obviously. A rather tortured history to this company. Panard is one of the first automobile manufacturers right around the turn of the century. The Panard rod on your car that you have, uh, the system Panard, which was the idea of engine in the front, transmission in the middle, rear end in the back. Uh, it all, we all take it for granted now, but the French really kind of invented it and perfected it. You know, they used to say that Germany was the birthplace of the automobile, but France was the nursery. France is where all the great ideas came from. This is one of the great companies, you know, ruined by, by well, by the government, really. You know, Panard used to make amazing cars like the Dynamique and all these sort of big, comfortable touring cars. And after the war, the, the government came in and decided, Panard, you'll do this, Citroen, you're gonna be the, build these cars, Renault, you. They just told people what to do, limited the amount of aluminum they could use and the amount of steel. Uh, so they really had to work with whatever they could. Uh, Panard was always a cash poor company, but a very innovative company. And this is what they came up with. Uh, I think it's a really attractive car. Uh, this was to compete against the Volkswagen. You know, in the 50s, uh, the Europeans thought they could do well here in America with small economical cars as opposed to our big American gas guzzlers, you know. Uh, Volkswagen had the better advertising campaign, uh, one of the greatest advertising campaigns of all time, you know, the Think Small and This Car's a Lemon and all those kind of ads that really caught people by surprise. But the Panard was, I think, a far superior car. It had half the number of cylinders as a Volkswagen, half the displacement just about, twice the horsepower. A Volkswagen could barely reach 68 miles an hour, Well, this was good for well over 90 miles an hour. You could put five or six people in it, but the government told them, no, you can't build a four-door, you gotta build two. I mean, they just limited who could build what in an attempt to, uh, to sort of help the industry. And the French really didn't, you know, the French's attitude was, if you like one of our cars, come on over here and buy one. You know, they didn't really sort of work hard the way Volkswagen did to capture that American market. Or this could have been uh, the Volkswagen. I think it's a lot more fun to drive. The engine is fascinating. I'll show you that in a little bit. It's, it's just a brilliant little piece of work. And to get 40 miles per gallon, and on the freeway, this car is very, very comfortable. Uh, the styling is what I find really interesting. If it looks a bit like the American Corvair from around 1960, that's sort of deliberate because they admired that car. You know, the Europeans thought the Corvair was a great American car, as I do also. They loved the greenhouse effect of it, how much room there was. This is a really compact car, but with an amazing amount of room inside. Uh, look at the rear leg room here. It's for, for such a tiny car with only two cylinders. The only drawback is the gear shift lever, which is a cable operated deal, which is kind of a bit all over the place, but I, that could be my fault. I've got to uh, fix that. We've got to do something with that. You know, Pinard uh, did very well in the uh, 24 Hours of Le Mans in what they call the index of performance. They didn't win it outright, but they always seemed to won, win their class, and they would, they would always kind of come up with things to sort of help the friend. Well, it won the most economical, you know, just okay. Anyway, it won it about 10 times, something like that. So the 24 stands for 24 hours of Le Mans. The BT, uh, it was a, the B model, and the T stands for, I guess, Tiger or Tiger, whatever. That was their high performance model with like 60 horsepower. But don't forget the Volkswagen only had 36 or 38 horsepower. So it was 
a little bit more expensive than the Volkswagen by about maybe 10%, but I think it was a far better car, far more advanced car, far more efficient car. But that's just me. I mean, I like Volkswagens, but I just thought this is a better looking car. And it didn't look quite as small as a Volkswagen. This you could mistake for almost a mid-size American. Well, it's still smaller than a Falcon or a Corvair, but uh, the styling is what really set it apart. This one, I'm told, was originally bought by a gentleman named Quinn Martin. Now, if you're my age, you remember TV in the 50s and 60s, you'll remember a Quinn Martin production clang, and they would it'd always be like the FBI, a Quinn Martin production. He always did a lot of those cop shows and drama shows, you know. And I, I understand he bought this in France and brought it here. I, I don't have any proof of that. That's just what I've been told by the previous uh, owner. So I, I suppose I should find that out. Just an interesting piece of history. Uh, I, I've never seen a, another one on the road in America. I know there are a few. I hear there's one in Oregon and there's a couple in New England. But I, I really haven't met any other BT owners. So hopefully I'll hear from them uh, when, when this airs. As you can see, beautiful trim. We had to make new, a bit of new trim here. We polished up the brake drums, which was done in period. The only thing I did differently was uh, the seats were not leather, they were vinyl, but I thought, you know, she's a good old girl, let's treat it to a, a nice leather interior. So it, it's really a wonderful car. It's so much fun to drive because, again, this is a classic case of using all the power all the time. It just revs fantastic. It's air-cooled. Uh, let, me, let me wheel the engine in here. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Okay, now here, here's your two cylinders. It's, it's uh, air-cooled. You've got a fan in front that blows the air back, which is sort of typical. Engine is in the front. Uh, roller bearing uh, crank. In the ads, they would say, just like a Bugatti, which is true. It does have a roller bearing crank. Uh, it's got torsion bar valves. Let me show you how this works here. Notice there's no head gasket because there's no head. The whole cylinder comes off, kind of like a, like a BMW sort of deal. Uh, there's just a base gasket, so you can't blow a head gasket. It's got a hemi head, hemispherical combustion chambers. If you look inside, you can see the valve. Well, there's no valves in there. You see where they go. But you see it's hemispherical with the spark plug in the center. And this here is a torsion bar. And you have a rocker arm that goes along here. Push rods come up the side here, or through these two holes here. And the torsion bar, it's a little tricky to adjust the valve, but once you get it, it's fine. And there's no valve spring, so float doesn't really come into the problem. Uh, it's a compact little engine. It's pretty light. You can lift it up and put it on the workbench. Just to give you an idea, you know, we had new rods made for our Christie fire engine. You know, the big 20-liter four-cylinder. Give you an idea what one of those what one of those connecting rods look like. Here you go. We had we had Carrillo make us some. Oh God, you don't want to know what that costs for Carrillo to make, <laughs> to make rods this size, but they're beautiful. Uh, and this is one of the original, but that's, that's another whole deal. I just thought you'd get a kick out of that. Oh, and here's one of those pistons, not off of this. But as you can see, it's a fascinating design. You see the, this is the torsion bar right here, which is basically just a big spring. It just has a lot of, and it just open, close, open, close, open, close the valves. And this thing loves to rev. I mean, it idles, it shakes a bit, juk, 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 but it, as soon as you put a, a few revolutions in it, it really smooths out, and it's really terrific. This is uh, all alloy, uh, a lot of aluminum in this motor. As I said, 850 cc's. It puts about 56 foot-pounds of torque, something like that, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but the car doesn't weigh a whole lot. It weighs just about 1,800 pounds, which is... Well, you, you'll see when we drive it, when you come for a ride, you, I think you'll be impressed with it because I just love driving it. It's just a lot of fun. Generator here. You can actually save more weight if you wanted to put a modern little Mitsubishi or something alternator on here and lose that. But I, I try to keep it all stock. Uh, well, you see how compact it is. One person can, how, how many cars can you take your engine out, put it on the workbench, rebuild it and put it back together again? And they're just nicely made. Let me wheel this out of the way again. Let's go to the back of the vehicle. Let's show you the trunk. 
show you how much room you have in this thing. Well, now first, let's open the hood. A little safety feature, you've got a light here on the armrest, so when you open the door in traffic, it will, you know, so you don't get run over. There you go. Let's open the hood. Now this car was running when I got it. We didn't have to do much to it. Just cleaned the carburetor, did a few things like that. I didn't polish it or do any of that. I re sleeve the master cylinder for the brakes. See right here, you've got the aluminum cover to pull air in to cool the engine. Uh, you see you've got cladding around the cylinders so the air distributes. Much bigger battery than is necessary, but I like these Optimus, so I put that in there. It actually had a much smaller battery. This always makes me laugh. This, it looks like a Martinelli's apple juice container, but that's actually a brake master cylinder. The French just do everything so unique. It's, it's really interesting. The exhaust pipe bolts to the frame with a rubber piece here to take out the vibration. And that's what holds the engine in place. The engine mount is also the exhaust pipe. That is something they have done on Panards for a long time. Uh, well, it's a very simple little deal here. Yeah, let's close this up again. Let me get the key and uh, open the trunk. Look at that. Pretty good sized trunk in there. I'm actually quite a large trunk. This was a family car, and there's all kinds of room in here. It's just a brilliant design. Reasonably fast, well, faster than it should be, actually. When you say two cylinders, you think, it's, oh my God, how slow is that gonna be? It's actually way faster than any Volkswagen that appeared, with half the number of cylinders and about half the displacement. Well, not quite half, but certainly two thirds. Uh, yeah, so. What else can we show you? We can show you underneath the car. I gotta show you them. The muffler was all rotted out. We had to make a brand new muffler from scratch. And you know, even, even the French, their mufflers are completely different than anybody. I just, well, I'll show you. We'll put it up on the lift, come on. Okay, we got it up on our sterile Coney lift here. Let's show you. Okay, here's the exhaust system that we, uh, we made from scratch. As you can see, it's different than any other exhaust system you'd find anywhere. You're not gonna go down to Midas and get one of these. Uh, this is all new pieces in here. We wanna keep it as rigid. See, hey, there's torsion bars back here as well. See, here we go. There's two of them right there. There are your drum brakes. Uh, okay, and you have tube shocks, okay. Oh, this is all original to the car. Nice and smooth under here. As you see, no rust. This is a nicely preserved example. The front, you have independent suspension, then you have these uh, leaf springs here. See, you got two into one there, the exhaust coming off the let me show you those engine mounts I was talking about. Can you see right up in here? You see this big rubber piece? Okay, this connects to the frame and then it connects to the exhaust pipe, which, which is your engine mount, which is really unusual. And obviously you have those on both sides. But how many cars can you, uh, oh, there's another one there. How many cars, you say, I took my engine out last week. Anybody help you? No, I, Took it out myself, oh, it's pretty cool. Here's that aluminum piece as well. See the way this all goes together? It's fascinating, isn't it? It's so different than anything that we do in America or have done in America. I just like the way the French think. 
and their cars are all about comfort and ride. That's what's kind of fun. I mean, this thing really rides, well, like a Cadillac. I mean, it, it's, it, it's amazing how supple it is. I mean, Volkswagens are kind of crude and bumpy, but extremely well made, of course. Whereas this had a real sophistication that uh, you just didn't find in a lot of other inexpensive European cars. But I think it's about time we probably took it for a ride now. Is there anything else I'm missing here? No, that's just about it. Uh, here's your, this is, if there's one part that's not real cool, it's this here. This shift, this is the cable here, and it winds around. I, we've got to pull that and lubricate it just to get a little. Once the car's running, it shifts fine, but it, it's just so kind of like this all over the place, you know, with your hands trying to shift. But, but other than that, it's really, really good. But this is such an unusual car. I'm glad we were able to save it. Come on, let's take it for a ride. various heater controls as well. Lights, wipers, horn is on the stock. Back in the day, I would much rather have had this than a Volkswagen Beetle. It doesn't look like the 60s. This could have been any time period. French cars just have the best suspension. You know, bumps that make you jerk the wheel in an ordinary car. This thing just kind of glides over. Much like a Citroën, although not that sophisticated. Everything is opposite on French cars. You know, your turn signal is on the right side, not on the left side. And this is the original color. I wanted to keep it as stock as I could. As you can see, this is a car I used to run errands and stuff in, so it's not a show car. We really didn't even take the engine out when we painted it, didn't need to. I mean, the engine seems to run fine. And there's quite an active club for these cars, too. The Panard clubs, you know, most people never heard of them, but uh, parts are available. There's a guy who races one of these. Uh, he shows up at Pebble, every year, or the Pebble Beach every year at historic races. He calls his car the Aardvark, and it has the running gear for one of these. And that thing beats everybody. It just takes them in the turns and handles. I gotta find out who that guy is. I mean, I'm pretty good size, and I fit this thing comfortably. Above four grand, it really comes alive. I love the thinking, I like how the brake drums are on the outside to kind of, and they're thin to keep them cool so the brakes don't overheat. I keep calling it a BT24, but technically it's a 24 BT, but I always put the letters first. I still got a little bit of work to do to it. Carburation is close to spot on, but not quite. We got a carburetor rebuild kit coming from France. But it's nice being air-cooled. You just don't have the problems you get sometimes when you find an old water-cooled car where the, especially when they're aluminum, and you know, the water is just eating out the cylinders or the intakes or any of that, you know? came new with Michelins on them from the factory. Just the mechanicalness of this engine intrigues me with the torsion bars and uh, the air cooling. 
the hemi head, the roller bearing crank. Even the connecting rods are on roller bearings. You got two sets of rollers, one big, one small. It's just fascinating, the engineering that went into this thing. You know, they could have made just a big flathead engine, you know, but they didn't. They made something extremely sophisticated and, and, and fun to drive. The engine just feels so lively. It just loves to work hard, so you don't mind beating on it. You're just driving your foot to the floor all the time. And when you take people for a ride and the sponsor says 150, they go, wow, it goes 150? Yeah, we're going 150 right now, kilometers. This engine loves to rev. What am I, about 4,500 RPM? is 47 miles per gallon. You know, the simplicity of air-cooled cars is really wonderful. You can't really have them anymore because of emissions and whatnot. You know, the clearances on, on new engines have to be much tighter. You can't allow exhaust gases and things to escape, but it's just nice. It's just one less thing, less thing to leak, you know, water pumps and radiators and, and hoses and all of that. But isn't that exhaust pipe Motor mount, just fascinating. They use the exhaust pipe as, as a motor mount, and you know, when that rubber starts steering, just replace it as you would any motor mount. But it's it just sort of funny to me. To think. Who thinks of that? And it works fine. You know, another really unusual feature, although we disconnected it, under the steering wheel, you have a, a knob you pull out, and it disconnects the battery. It comes like that from the factory. And uh, it kept shorting out on us. I don't know why it would smoke and catch fire. Uh, okay, we ran the ground wire. But it just, it was, I said, you know something, let's just take it out and put in a regular knife switch, on-off switch under the hood. And that's what we did. But that was kind of interesting. I guess that was like a safety thing or an anti-theft deal. I mean, you pull it out and it would snap back, but the battery would disconnect it. Then you got this weird thing in the center of the dash here. It's got a little car on it, and you flip it, and it, uh, I think it directs the ventilation either to the windshield or wherever you want it to go. And the heater works on this very well, which is interesting for an air-cooled car. Yo! Kind of wonder how light this thing could be if it was carbon fiber. It's got a lot of aluminum in it, but also a lot of steel. Bernards were hugely popular in France. Uh, they sold quite a few of these. They just never marketed much to the American market because they didn't care about it, I guess. Peugeot was all set to come back to the American market, but then, I don't know, they changed their mind. I don't know what happened there. That's another great French car. You look at that early, uh, was it 1913 Peugeot that ran in Indianapolis? Hemi heads, overhead cam, four valves, a very sophisticated motor. To this day, it still is. If I'm not mistaken, I think it ran in 1913 and then qualified in the 1948 race. Something like that. Pretty amazing. I just like this engine because it's screaming its heart out and you're not damaging it, you know? You can't really do that so much with it. Well, I guess you could with American engines, but... It's just designed that way, which is what I love. Using all 56 foot pounds of torque there, boy. Anyway, I know these odd little cars like this don't do as well as the Lamborghinis and the Corvettes and all the fancy cars. But you know, they're a lot of fun and it's a piece of history and it's uh, it's just fun to share. I hope you enjoy watching these as much as I like making them. And uh, we'll see you guys next week with uh, hopefully something even more strange. Well, probably not as strange as this, but well, I just have to wait and see. See you then. Thanks, everybody.
Mm-hmm. <laughs>